And uh, I would invite us all to use these moments of preparation to, to prepare ourselves to worship the living God.
Once again, uh, good morning, and uh, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to this Lord's Day worship of God. A special welcome to each and every one of you, and as uh, I'm sharing some of the announcements, I would invite and encourage you to please make use of the Ministry of Friendship pew pad. Those of you closest to the aisle will find it beside you. Please pick it up, provide the information requested, and share it with your neighbor beside whom you're worshiping this morning. Special welcome to Carrie Burstalem Evans, who is our guest preacher today and August the 21st and the 28th when we uh, resume our regular schedule. Uh, delighted to have Carrie uh, with us. I first met Carrie when you were a seminarian when I came here, so uh, and uh, delighted you're here. Uh, she's a child of this congregation, if you're not uh, aware of that, but now a very accomplished young woman and Presbyterian minister and uh, welcome delighted that you are here so also um, uh, Pam Kime could you just stand up in place I'm not going to embarrass you by calling you forward so um, Pam has been our interim uh, music director uh, since Josh's resignation last December, and she has served us with a tremendous amount of expertise and faith and love and joy and spiritedness, and uh, personally I've uh, been uh, delighted to call her colleague. So thank you very much for your service. It means a great deal. Looking ahead, uh, two weeks out is the church picnic. That's going to be on the 14th of August. That is our last Sunday of our summer schedule. Um, and following the 10 o'clock service, we're going to get together for a picnic in Jim Barnett Park, Kiwana Shelter Number 1. Uh, that's uh, uh, food at noon, then activities for children, youth, and adults, and uh, the so uh, softball game at 1, and my team is looking for its 22nd consecutive victory. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think that's right, but you might want to check those numbers and the accuracy of that statement, but uh, uh, don't miss it. And each year I've noticed that it takes a little longer to recover, but it's always worth it. It's always worth it. So um, there's a sign up here saying, hey, I'm going to come. And if you want to play ball, there's a sign up there as well. Um, any additional announcements that require our attention uh, this morning? If not, uh, yes. Next Saturday, which would be August the 6th, and if you recall, the first uh, Saturday of every month, we not only provide the food and the location, we also provide the staff. And so folks can sign up at the mission kiosk, correct? So if you can help out next Saturday, August the 6th, please do. Thank you very much. Jubilee Kitchen. So. Do I, should I ignore the word introit? Oh, call to worship. Uh, it says introit, but okay. Um, it's summertime. We can be relaxed. <laughs> Please join me then in the responsive call to worship. Give thanks and praise to the Lord. For God has dealt mercifully with us. Even when we turned our backs on God. Rejoice in God's abundant love. We will continually praise God, who heals and loves us. Amen.
Let us join our hearts and minds and voices as together we offer our sin to God using the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts to understand the way of love. Open our hearts to try the way of peace. Open our hearts to live the way of generosity. We pray in the name of Christ, lover of us all, prince of peace, generosity incarnate. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace with God and with your neighbor. Amen. Be seated, please. If there are uh, younger children in the congregation, uh, during the summer months, our Sunday school runs uh, at the same time as the 10 a.m. sanctuary service, so uh, those folks are invited to go find the Sunday school class. And, uh, um, but let us take a few moments to pass the peace of Christ and greet our neighbor beside whom we are worshiping this day. So say howdy.
Good morning. It is good to be home this morning. So thank you, Dan, for inviting me back and for um, all of you for welcoming me. I've gotten some great um, just welcome back, Carrie, and that's been a real blessing to me. Um, before we go to God with scripture, I want to first go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful Lord, it is only by your word that we can begin to understand who we are and whose we are. So silence all other words around us. Help us, Lord, to settle our hearts and minds on your word as it is read, it's proclaimed, and let them not be my words but yours so that you might be great in this place and in each one of our lives. Through your son's name we ask this. Amen. So as I told the other two services, I've kind of gone rogue on the Old Testament this morning, and I'll go back to the lectionary for the second passage of scripture, which is in Luke. But first, we're going to look at Isaiah and the prophet Isaiah, who was one of my favorites. And when I finish scripture, you're going to hear some very familiar words from one of your beloved pastors. And those words also come from Isaiah. See if you can figure out what I'm going to say. But first, we're going to start with Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 13. And the RSV, Revised Standard Version, has the very first word being ho or listen up. But I'm going to change that just one letter. Because when my dad calls the dogs to eat, and if you know my parents, you know they love their dogs, he calls them to eat, he has them sit, and he goes, whoa. And so this is where I want to start the scripture this morning to each one of you, not that you're a dog, but that you're the Israelites, and God is saying, whoa, before you get the good things in life, listen up. Get it? Isn't that great? Whoa. Whoa. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in fatness. Incline your ear, and come to me here, that your soul may live." And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call nations that know you not, and nations that you knew you not shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not but to water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, and it shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial for an everlasting sign which shall not be cut off. These are the words of Isaiah. And now we'll turn to the Gospel of Luke. And Luke speaks to us of a very familiar passage and one that we're not really comfortable with. And somebody told me in the last service, I can't say early service anymore, in the last service they said, well, you really held our feet to the fire there. And I'm Sorry about that, but it's really not me. It would be God. So hear the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the rich fool. 
One of the multitudes said to him, Teacher, bid my brother divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought to myself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I shall store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, rest, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The prophet Isaiah says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me with that. Thanks be to God. So we're actually going to start the sermon this morning in a far-off land, one that you've no doubt seen on any news network that you might choose to watch. You've seen these pictures all over the place, and somehow we're able to dismiss ourselves from them because we don't relate. They are refugee camps that we find all over the world. And instantly, I hope, in your mind, you have a picture. So here are some of the statistics. The population in Sri Lanka, 100,000 in a refugee camp. A Sudanese camp, one camp alone, 82,000 people. Palestinian camps, refugee camps, count over 3.9 million people. And I asked the kids in the first service if they could count that high, and they were, yeah, no. 63,000 refugees in just one Uganda camp. All in different countries around the world, Darfur, Pakistan, Thailand. And in this place, for those refugees, it is home, but not home. I want to set that stage because these people are in a perpetual state of waiting. Waiting for clean water, waiting for food, waiting for an honest government, waiting for peace, and most of all, waiting to return home. And you and I do not get that. I do not claim to understand that world. Refugee camps are something that we can only see in pictures, where we see dust settling on everybody, little children running around naked and barefoot, flies swarm and land on infants' faces. The old look so much older. And the first time they stepped foot in that refugee camp after leaving home, I imagine they thought, it's just temporary just momentary, just a little bit. I have hope that I'm going home. But over the course of generations upon generations, it is home, but not home. And it's important for you to realize that, because that is where our Israelites are found this morning. They are, as I love to put it, in a serious timeout. God had seen them, and they kept misbehaving, so he said, you know what? guys, I'm going to take you and you're not going to the promised land. You get in the wilderness for 40 years, time out until you can straighten up. How many have done that to their kids? Yeah. So Israelites are in a serious time out over here and our scripture meets us this morning where finally they get to hear you're going home. Now, when they got there, they got put in the time out. They thought it would be just temporary, but then generations, as I said, just like the refugee camps today, became generation after generation. So the children of the Israelites didn't really understand what that promised land was. They didn't really know what home was. They were caught in living in limbo, if you would, and that's the title of the sermon, that living in that in-between world where they're waiting for the next thing to happen. And I want to suggest that this morning as we look at Isaiah, and like I said, I don't claim to understand that world, nor do I want to diminish it, 
But I want to begin by thinking that maybe you and I aren't so far removed from it. Maybe, if you will, we can call ourselves backward refugees. Home, we each have one. A little square piece of the planet that we get to have with four walls, and as we'll learn later in the sermon, with lots of barns. You get that, don't you? Home. But we live in this limbo where we're caught between a couple of different things. We're never quite settled because we want one more thing. We're never quite ready. And if we're truth in our faith, we're still not home. If we're honest with who we are as the people of faith, we are each still in that wilderness timeout waiting to go home. So then the Israelites get to hear these absolutely phenomenal words that say, with the very first word, what is it? Whoa, I didn't hear you. Whoa. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, it's okay. Just come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Now, you've got to imagine those Israelites going home back to the promised land thinking, I don't even know if home's still there. And can you imagine what they would have found when they got to the marketplace? Different smells and different foods. And, well, this doesn't sit right. This isn't home. And God knew that. So he said, whoa, listen up, everything is going to be different, but I have got you covered. So let's take it one step further. You and I live in this world where we have everything covered. We have all that we ever need, but be honest if we're selves, if we're actually actively trying to go home. And over and over again in our parables, in scripture, God tries to remind us what home is, and we listen for just a few minutes, maybe 20, if you're lucky this morning. Then we go on back about our regular day, and we're back to normal. So I'm going to dumb it down for you. And I love to do a parable of something in the modern day world. So this morning, your parable is the parable of the Happy Meal. Now my kids are now 17 and 12, so they don't like Happy Meals anymore. But I just saw some kids walk in, and I bet they love their Happy Meals. It may not be McDonald's anymore. It may be Chick-fil-A. And see, they're getting patted on the head. But I want to tell you about the Happy Meal, because if you drive up through the drive through line with a van full of kids, they're all screaming for different things. One wants nuggets. One wants a burger. One wants a burger with ketchup. One wants a burger with lettuce. But no onion. Can't touch the onion. And nobody wants pickles. So you're, as a mom, you're trying to figure out the whole thing with the Happy Meals. And then, of course, comes the dreaded toy. The dreaded toy. We all know about it. Because then I want Pokemon. I want Barbie. I want Mario Kart. I want a car. And now I've just dated myself. But you see where I'm going with it. And so our kids are never happy with what they have. They always want one more above. The parable of the Happy Meal. And I have a dear friend named Holly. And she's sarcastic as they come. And I love her for it. So this was her commentary on the Happy Meal. What is so happy about them? Kids cry because they already have the toy. This is true. I cry when I step on the toy. Very true. Dad cries when he sees the toys laying around the house. Kids cry again when mom throws the toy away. There is absolutely no happiness in a happy meal. <laughs> then, when the kids get fat from eating all the happy meals, the only one happy is indeed the lawyer. And I'm sorry if you're a lawyer sitting here and you're in the middle of a lawsuit, but... The lawyer is the one that's suing them for not telling us they were bad for us. So the price for that Happy Meal, my friends, is high. Really, really high. The parable of the Happy Meal. We're never quite content. It seems in our world that happiness cannot be bought for $3.50 at a drive through window. It seems that happiness cannot be bought a good game for the computer or a TV show or a new entertainment system, and I would be well to be reminded, my husband's here this morning, that ha good happy happiness cannot be bought by a new outfit or a new pair of shoes. My 17-year-old son could be reminded that happiness is not bought by a new truck in the driveway. Happiness is not bought by those things that we can purchase, or those things we, yes, put in our barns, but by something that we just can't grasp. Something we can't really put our hands on, and so we give up. 
You see, our pleasure set point adapts to the new things we have in life. Once we get the new car, the one-car garage isn't big enough. So we have to go to the two-car garage, then the five-car garage, and how big is your barn? Your barn's probably bigger than mine, or maybe not, because I couldn't even zip my purse this morning. I want to tell you another story. I have the joy and the pleasure of being the executive director of a nonprofit. And the kids that we work with in our program are the at-risk kids in the community. They are the ones that you see on TV every day. If we have a 30% success rate with our kids that they don't go to jail, they haven't shot somebody, they haven't dealt drugs, whatever happens in their world, 30% out of all of them that we serve, we are thinking we're doing a good job. And as the director of a nonprofit, of course, funds are always tight. Now, I tell you this because when I write a sermon, I usually take the scripture and I kind of sit with it for a week or so. And I kind of look at it throughout the day, and Dan probably does something very similar. And I have it sitting on my desk at work, just sitting over there in the corner, because I never know when God's going to speak. And sometimes I even have it sitting beside my bedside table, because God sometimes speaks at the very unfortunate hour of 3 a.m. So God is speaking to me in my office, and I wasn't really listening. The scripture's here, and the mail is here. And I open up a letter, and in it is a commitment for $10,000 that I did not expect. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. That is awesome in the non How would you like to have that in your mail tomorrow morning, Dan? I'll take it. Well, I had two. So I had $20,000 last week that I did not expect. And for a new director, not even having been there a year, the first thing that went through my mind was, dang, I'm good. And then I thought, i got a board meeting in a month, and I'm going to deposit those checks, and I am going to look really good to my board of directors. If you're on a nonprofit board and your new director had a $20,000 windfall, her job would be secure, correct? And then I got scripture sitting over here saying, don't build up yourself barns. Don't store your wheat. I'm sitting here thinking, oh, but it's much better in the bank. And then we have... The A number one success story in our entire organization, Greg walks into my office. Now, we have 123 kids in camp every day. And when they come to me, they have not eaten since the day before when I fed them lunch. True story. And so every day, we feed them tied you over packs to send home so they can then go take home and actually eat a meal because their parents are gone, absent for whatever reason. And so Greg walks into my office, and he um, just opened the checks, mind you. Greg walks into my office and he says, I don't have any food to send home with the kids today. And I'm like, oh, man. And so, you know, I flip the Bible closed. Do you get where I'm going? Don't store yourself up in these barns. And I want to ask you, and you've got to ask yourself, what's in your barn? Because God is saying, I have something better. You don't need that because what I have is a free gift. Whoa. God says, and that sounds really good with the microphone. My barns need to be emptied out. And my husband would sit there and go, amen, Carrie, get to work. What are your barns full of? They're not full of wheat these days, and they're probably not even full of money these days. Maybe they're not even full of shoes or clothes or cars or electronics. Maybe they're full of, you know, rest days because you need to take some time off instead of serving. Wow, that's a little harsh. Maybe your barn has something else that you're keeping all to yourself. Maybe it's a talent or a gift. that You're just not ready to share because you're not sure there will be enough. And God says, whoa, to you, the backwards refugees, I got you covered. Come to the waters, God says, it is all good. You have no money, your barns are empty, you are still welcome here. Come by and eat. You don't get it because you and I live in a world of capitalism. Paul's a banker. I live by economics and capitalism. I did not do the economics classes in school. I went to seminary so I didn't have to balance a checkbook. These are all true things in my life. But in the economics textbook, this is what it says. Productive resources are limited, whereas the desires of human beings are virtually unlimited. Because people's desire for a thing generally exceed the amount of that thing that is available. And this, my friends, is capitalism. We have to make choices and select among restricted alternatives. And as the economic textbook says, scarce goods have a cost. There are no free lunches. 
And that's the world you and I live in. And let's be honest, as soon as you leave these walls, that's the world you return to. But for just a moment, understand that God is not a capitalist. He did not attend the economic seminar in college. God does not know the meaning of scarcity or limited resources. God does not know what that means because God is grace. And so God's got lots of barns, I kid you not, but each, each and every single one of them is a whole load of grace. And I don't know about you, but I need a whole ton of it. God is not like us. So we go back to that passage, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And I'll tell you one more story. In a church in Charlotte, I had a young kid who had tried to commit suicide twice. Every time he came to youth group, his arms were cut, and I talked to him each and every time. Until one day in Advent, he comes to me, and he had his scripture, and he had Isaiah, who is my very favorite prophet. He says, you know what? It turns out that my ways are not what God really wants. God's ways are bigger than mine. God's got a bigger plan. His ways are different than mine. And he says, I get it. And I sit there and I go, well, i got to read it again because I'm not sure I get it. Because I'm more happy with my ways. I'm happy with my barns. I'm happy with my life. I'll be honest. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? These are hard words to hear. We work longer hours. We work more and more each and every day. We make more money than we know what to do with or we know what to do with. We spend money on things that will just burn up and die away. But are we satisfied? We don't even know that we're empty until we look at some of these scripture passages that offer to fill us. Listen carefully to me, God says, and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food, says Isaiah, and says our Lord. So the prophet Isaiah would say to you, and most importantly to me, whoa, settle down, come on home. And to that, I begin to empty out my barn. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all glory to him and him alone. Amen and amen. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere. Hear us as we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, your unity, your peace, your church here in Winchester, your church in Ethiopia, your church in Guatemala, your church in Bangladesh. Grant that all who trust you may also follow you and live together in love. Lord, we lift before you the nations of the world. Lead them in ways of justice, ways of goodwill. Direct those who govern our nation, the President of the United States, the members of our Congress, the justices of our courts, the governor of our commonwealth, our legislators in Richmond. May they rule fairly, may they maintain order, may they uphold those on the margins, our neighbors in need. May they defend the oppressed. For your prophets remind us that these are the things that make for true peace. Awaken us, O Lord, to the dangers we have inflicted upon the earth. Implant in each of us a reverence for all that you have made. 
that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations. Lord, in our transition in the life of this congregation, we lift before you the members of our pastor nominating committee, that you would hold them and guide them and direct them. We pray as well uh, through our membership role this year. This day we lift before you that you may bind them to you and them to us and us to them. We pray for Bob and Shirley Crookshank, for Addison and Alexander and Finn and Harper and Jennifer and Katie Sordas, for Danny Cummings, for Ellen Cunningham and Jane Cunningham, for Sarah Curran, for Linda Curtis, for Caitlin and Michael and Noah and Raina Catrona, for Ann Lynn Daly, for Carolyn Daly, for Douglas Daly, for Hugh Daly, for Jacob Daly, for Jace and Robbie and Tecla Daly, for Elaine Davis, for Maddie Davis, for Mary Davison, for Chris and Emily and Georgie Deering. And Lord, we pray as well for Adam as he seeks a job, for Katie Snyder who undergoes surgery on Wednesday, and for Burton Robinson who will undergo surgery this week as well. Comfort and relieve, O oh Lord, all who are in trouble, in sorrow, in poverty, in sickness, in grief. Those battling addiction and the challenges of mental illness. We lift before you those known to us whom we now name before you in silence. Lord, hear us. Heal them in body. Heal them in mind. Heal them in circumstance. Work in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. We offer these prayers and all prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Be seated, please. Hear these words of the psalmist who declares, The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. With gladness, let us now present the offering of our life and our labor to God. John, thank you. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness we have gifts to share. Accept and use us and our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. <clears throat> 